here in the United States. And as you'll see as I read the list of people we thank for this lecture series, it's a very long list because many people have understood the importance of this topic. So today, let me thank those who have made this lecture series possible. This series was made possible in part by support from Richard and Ronnie Lippin, the Author W. Page Center for Integrity and Public Communication, the Center for Healthcare and Policy Research, the Center for Human Development and Family Research in Diverse Contexts, the Children, Youth, and Families Consortium, the Department of Biobehavioral Health, the Department of Health Policy and Administration, the Department of Sociology, the Gerontology Center, Penn State's College of Medicine's Department of Humanities, the Pre-Med Program, the School of Nursing, and the University Libraries. The Rock Ethics Institute events are also made possible with the support of a generous gift from Douglas and Julie Rock. Part of the reason that I invited President Spanier to introduce Dean Kirsch is not only because of the importance of Dean Kirsch to Penn State's vision of health as a human right, but also because President Spanier himself has been committed to thinking about our health and health care priorities both here at Penn State and in the larger realm. So I'm sorry he's not here today to introduce Dean Kirsch, but even when you're a president, you don't get more than eight minutes. So I will do the honors of welcoming Daryl Kirsch. Is he here? He's coming, he's coming. So. Um, he's running. <laughs> that means I now tell jokes, right? <laughs> yes, you've got a good one, Nancy. <laughs> Since, since I, I, I can't sing or, or play the washboard. Um. <laughs> so let me, let me use this time to mention that this lecture series is a part of a um, eight uh, series lectures. We, we have posters outside and we urge you to look at those lecture series. Also, to keep an eye out for spring events in the Rock Ethics Institute, we have a lot going on in this area. Jonathan Bruckup, who's in the front row, is hosting a conference on Islamic bioethics. So if you're interested in that, you can grab him and talk to him afterwards. We also have a um, series of events on the anniversary of the Nazi doctor's trial. So we welcome you to keep an eye on our webpage and take a look at what's happening in, in both the Health as a Human Right lecture series and other institute-related events. So after telling everyone that one only waits for a president for seven minutes, <laughs> though faculty they have to wait for it for 15, I'm delighted to welcome President Graham Spanier, who will be introducing our speaker for today. Well, thank you. Actually, I, I had a good excuse. I had on the phone uh, a donor who pledged $3 million. So, uh, you know, I didn't want to... <laughs> I just want to let him finish the conversation. So you don't mind, do you? Not in the least. I regret to say, though, that it was not for uh, the library or for the Rock Ethics Institute or for the Medical Center. But it was for athletics. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Daryl G. Kirch, who is uh, Senior Vice President for Health Affairs at Penn State, Dean of Penn State's College of Medicine, and the Chief Executive Officer of the Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. Dr. Kirch has headed Penn State's medical enterprise since the year 2000, and his leadership has been extraordinary. In his first year at Penn State, Dr. Kirch and his administrative team directed a $23 million turnaround of the medical center following the end of the Penn State Geisinger merger. Since then, the medical center has shown exceptionally solid financial performance and dramatic growth. 
In 2004, the hospital and clinics had 23,700 admissions, nearly 700,000 outpatient clinic visits, 45,000 emergency room visits, and more than 18,000 surgical cases. Each year, more than 360 resident physicians are trained in medical specialties at the medical center. Since becoming dean, total research funding at the Hershey Medical Center has increased from $55 million to more than $100 million this year. Darrell is currently overseeing an ambitious master plan that calls for the renovation of 650,000 square feet of existing facilities and the addition of more than 800,000 square feet of new space by 2010. Included in this plan are new facilities for Penn State's Children's Hospital and the Penn State Cancer Institute. Dr. Kurtz is widely recognized for his work on the neurobiology of mental disorders. He's held a number of national leadership positions in academic medicine, including past chair of the Governing Council of the Section on Medical Schools of the American Medical Association. He serves as co-chair of the Liaison Committee on Medical Education, the entity that oversees accreditation of medical schools in the United States. Before coming to Penn State, Dr. Kurtz was Senior Vice President for Clinical Activities and Dean of the School of Medicine of the Medical College of Georgia, and also oversaw a number of laboratories at the National Institute of Mental Health he earned both his bachelor's degree and his medical degree from the University of Colorado, where in 2002, he was named a distinguished alumnus. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Daryl Kirch, who will speak on the topic of the best healthcare in the world, question <laughs> mark. Great. Thank you for a kind introduction. Although, after the list of sponsors in the introduction, I guess we're about out of time now, so we'll just... Uh, I'm one of those wanderers, much to the chagrin of the person who's trying to uh, video this for webcasting, so I apologize to you. But most of all, I do that because I want to engage you. I don't know why you're here today. You know, you each have your own reason. Uh, but I want you to leave here today feeling a genuine sense of personal urgency. You know, unrelated to, to whatever got you here, that's the reason that I, I want you to listen to me and hopefully engage with me, especially at the end in some dialogue. I want to thank Nancy and the Rock Institute for putting this uh, series together. Uh, this, I think, is the issue of the decade if not the century for us in America. You, know, you can certainly turn your attention, whether it's to the disaster of 9-11 or, or what we've seen in New Orleans the last few weeks, but I would posit that health care, and especially some of the ethical issues related to health care that this series is highlighting, is where your energy should really be focused now. My perspective uh, is that of a faculty member. Yes, I have a faculty appointment, but you, you are going to hear some great scholars in this series as the, the series goes forward. Uh, I live in the real world of healthcare. As Graham's introduction pointed out, I'm responsible minute by minute for the largest healthcare delivery system in central Pennsylvania. I sit in my office and the Lifeline helicopter is flying in and out with critically ill often dying people on a daily basis. That's, that's the part of the university we live in. So while I think I have some more academic or scholarly points I want to convey to you, what I really feel about this comes from watching it happen day in and day out, seeing patients come into the system, some of them leave better, some of them not get better. So let's take a straw poll to get things started. Uh, forced choice. You have to, to uh, answer yes or no to this. And the question is the title of the talk. Does the United States have the best health care in the world? Question mark. No editing of the question. <laughs> All those who vote yes? Anybody vote with me? Gosh, we only got about a third here. All those who vote no? I cheated. I said you had to make a choice. I didn't say you could make two choices. 
<laughs> and that, in fact, is the dilemma. What, what we're going to walk through here in the next few minutes is how we can be in this situation where some of us, uh, and Graham and I included, think that we are the best in the world, and yet at the same time, we think that there are reasons why we're not. So, what's the evidence? What's the database? Well, one I'm very fond of is THON. Some of you are probably participating in THON this year one way or another. THON, as you may or may not know, is now about 31, 32 years old. When a child was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the first year THON started, they had a 1 in 10 chance of living through that leukemia. 1 in 10. Today, the children that you see at THON who mix on the floor of Rec Hall have an 8 in 10 chance of surviving the diagnosis of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. That's a miracle. That is truly a miracle, especially when you see these children. Uh, what is that the result of? It's the result of American science, American medical care coming together. We have done a wonderful job of making sure that every child in this country, virtually every child, gets into a, a, a protocol-driven treatment for their leukemia. And many of them, years later, uh, it's only a dim memory. We've had dancers in THON who were THON patients a decade earlier. That's, that's miraculous. Uh, I mentioned Lifeline. It, if you came down to Hershey today, and I took you up to the seventh floor, we'd walk into the NICU, Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. 32 isolates, right, for newborns. Most of those newborns were born elsewhere. They're brought to Hershey because uh, they are premature, or they have other medical problems uh, bringing them to us. A baby born at 24 weeks Think about that. 24 weeks of gestation in this country, which may mean that baby weighs as little as a pound and a half. Start to think about the size of that baby. Has a 50% chance of surviving in this country. That's a miracle. Now, uh, let's say one of our fine professorial colleagues here in the front row, they're all males, so they have a little greater risk for, for uh, heart disease, right? Let's say one of them started to experience, as I make them more and more anxious in the course of this talk, <laughs> started to experience crushing chest pain, radiating down into their left arm and their jaw, right? We'd call the emergency medical service and whisk them off. Well, when I was in medical school, which please, it was not the dark ages. <laughs> it was only 30 years ago. I'll tell you what would have happened in that case. That person with that crushing chest pain, angina, right? would have come into the emergency room, we would have started to draw blood tests. And what we were looking for in those blood tests was evidence that they had an MI, myocardial infarction, that their heart tissue was dying. And we'd take three days of blood tests before we'd make the decision about whether they had an MI or not. And then, you know what they'd do if they had that MI? They'd sit in the hospital for two to three more weeks, hoping their heart feet, uh, healed, hoping that they didn't develop heart failure, hoping that they didn't have another MI. But that was the standard of care. Well, what happens if that occurs today? Uh, we rush them over to the emergency room. Uh, I decided to not inflict PowerPoint on you, but I did bring some visual aids. Uh, we'd rush them over to the emergency room. If that, his that history is a, a dead ringer for myocardial ischemia, right? Uh, they would be wheeled next door. The catheter uh, would be threaded up an artery, often now from the wrist, very non-invasively. The dye would have been injected, and we would know within minutes, if not a few hours, uh, whether there was a blockage in that left anterior descending artery. And what if there was, right? Well, the catheter, uh, and uh, you can come up and look at these later, has the ability to remove that blockage. Not only does it have the ability to remove the blockage, but now, within the last decade, we've developed the ability to put in a stent. And you can come up and see. A stent is a very expensive, very small Chinese handcuff, <laughs> essentially. Remember the, the matrix, the, the uh, geometry of that? That's what a stent is. 
Blockage cleared, stent put in place, so the blockage doesn't reform. Pretty darn amazing, isn't it? But maybe there are four vessels diseased or five vessels diseased. Then uh, it turns over to the surgeons. The invasive cardiologists call in their colleagues. Uh, in this case, it might be Dr. Pei on our staff, and he would perform a coronary artery bypass graft, right? Simple as that. And even, let's say that all of that didn't intervene and that two or three months later, your heart is failing. The left side of your heart is failing. Uh, when I was in medical school, that was your route to death. But today, you might be a candidate for a heart transplant. If you're not a candidate for a heart transplant, you might enter a protocol to have the left side of your heart replaced by a left ventricular assist device. No wires outside the body. The pump goes in, the battery pack goes in a different spot, the reservoir to handle the volume changes tucks in a different spot. You recharge it by wearing a belt and having radio waves go through your skin. Is this a miracle or what? And, and it has been largely science. I don't want to detract from our European colleagues, but science in this country, uh, our clinical practice in this country has driven these kinds of innovations. So that sounds like the best to me. That sounds like evidence for the best. But how about another piece of evidence? Usually you get what you pay for, right, in this world? Well, we spend more on health care. If you haven't picked up a newspaper and seen this fact, I don't know what planet you've been on. We spend far more for health care in this nation than any other developed nation. You know, how do we get there? Well, let's go back to our visual aids. If you came in, the catheterization was done, and guess what? Your coronary arteries were clean as a whistle. It was just a panic attack about that lecture you were going to give. Leave the hospital that day. The bill for that would be about $5,000. But what would the bill be if there was a blockage and they had to move to clearing it with angioplasty and put the stent in? About $11,000. Uh, what would the bill be for the left ventricular assist device if you happen to be in a protocol and the costs were being allocated? $205,000. How often do we have to do things like that? Hundreds of thousands of angiograms, coronary angiograms are done in this country every year. How often do we do things like that at those kinds of expenses before it starts to add up? That's how this year, by most estimates, we will spend two trillion, with a T, two trillion dollars on healthcare. Now, who can tell me what that works out as if you divide it by the number of people in the United States? Six, roughly six thousand dollars per man, woman, and child. Uh, how many of you think, and, and don't if you, I don't want to invade anybody's privacy, but how many of you think? You spent personally, as an individual, $6,000 on health care last year. A couple of you. You know, it doesn't take much these days, you know, surgery or something, but very few hands went up. How, how do we get to the point of $2 trillion? It, it adds up, and it adds up in a subset uh, of the population. So we certainly are the best, we are the best, without doubt, at spending money on health care. Uh, the, the people who talk, come close to us, Switzerland and Norway, are, are still, we spend 50% more than those two countries. We spend twice as much as the average industrialized country. Another way I personally experience us being the best is I see it in the academic health centers of the United States. I, I have the honor uh, as Graham mentioned, of chairing the body that accredits medical schools. Over the years, I've probably been to two-thirds of the medical schools in the United States. We have a great system of medical education. People would love to come here from other nations in the world to go to medical school. Really, very few of them are given the opportunity. And we have people from all over the world clamoring to get into residency training in the United States. Isn't that evidence of the best? 
No other country sees this to the degree we do. So, there's no question that we have the most resources, that we have incredible expertise, that we have technologically some of the most advanced facilities, and I would argue that when those things come together right, you probably do get the best health care. Correct? So what's the problem? Why don't, why don't we just close up shop here, consider the question answered? Well, let's talk about the, some other aspects of the, this that, that I think about on a daily basis and I want you to think about. Okay. First of all, the best system should have the best results, right? So how do we do in terms of the results of our health system. How is your health status collectively? Right? You all believe you're healthy. But if you add us up as the American population, how well do we compare to the rest of the world? Well, if you want to look at a very interesting website sometime, go into uh, OECD.org. OECD uh, stands for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And it's an entity that gather statistics from 30 nations, uh, all the way from the biggest economies, the US, Japan, Germany. Uh, but it, it, the, 30, the group of 30 includes uh, Czech, the Czech Republic. It includes Turkey. It includes Mexico. And they aggregate those data. And then they report back to countries about how they're doing. Well, how are we doing on infant mortality? Worse than the average of those 30 countries. How are we doing on life expectancy? Worse than the average. There's one, uh, actually, there are, there's one where we're absolutely the worst of the 30. Anybody have a guess? 30 nations, and we're the worst. Obesity. Our rate is over 30%. Guess who's number two? Mexico, but only at 24% of the population crossing the criterion for being obese. There are, um, there actually is one where we're the best. There are two where we're the best, I'm sorry. And guess which they are? Well, one is we're the best at spending money, right? <laughs> Far and away, we've got that one locked down. Guess what the other one is? I'd be very surprised if anybody gets this. Smoking. Together with Canada and Sweden in this cohort of 30 nations, we have the lowest cohort of adults who smoke. Any of you who've traveled internationally may not be as surprised by that. I, I, I continue to be amazed, uh, especially traveling in Europe this summer, at, at the prevalence of smoking. So we spend the most money, and we've done the best job on smoking cessation, but on everything else, we're mediocre at best. Now it starts to get a little more personal for me because I see this actually happen. And there's another area where I would question whether we're the best. And it's this issue of quality and safety. Do you, if you were hospitalized today, would you feel safe? probably less likely to today than five years ago, because roughly five years ago, now six years ago, the Institute of Medicine issued its famous report called To Air is Human. Uh, they also have a great website, iom.gov, and if you want to get into any of these reports and their executive summaries, you can get to them. The main conclusion of To Air is Human got national headlines. And their main conclusion was every year in this country, it's hard to pin down, but by their estimate, somewhere between 40 and 90,000 Americans die from medical mistakes while they're hospitalized. And they, the metaphor that people used that got everyone's attention was, do you realize that's the equivalent 
of a large jetliner crashing every day. You know, that the magnitude of these health system accidents was equal to the magnitude of a jet crash <coughs> happening every day. Well, that really woke a lot of us up. And it caused us to think about how that happens. Now, I think that the people I know who deliver health care, and there are people in this room who aspire to be nurses, physicians, and others, are some of the best, most well-intentioned people I'll ever have the pleasure of meeting. They do not get up in the morning saying, I think I'm going to slack off and be a little careless today in the OR. Uh, they very much want to do the right thing. But the American healthcare system, healthcare system really worldwide increasingly, is a very complicated, dangerous world. I cannot give you a drug without a side effect. In a hospital, I can't order a drug without literally dozens of people being involved in one way or another. We build layer upon layer of complexity, and within the seams of those layers, things happen and people do die. None of us are happy about this. Uh, I recently in encountered a case, talked with a physician actually, who was heartbroken because in the case of a newborn, they, uh, needing resuscitation, had placed the endotracheal tube in order to ventilate the newborn, and it felt middle of the night, hectic, everything's going on, the alarms are going off, had thought and it believed and it checked and it believed it was uh, in the airway, but it had dropped into the esophagus. You know, imagine the size of some of these newborns. Things like that can happen, and they can happen when the chaos is raining. Now, if, if you climb on an airliner and one of the red lights goes on, you know, they tell you, sorry, folks, we're going to sit tight. You know, you don't have the luxury of that in the ER or in the operating room or in the ICU. The red lights may be going on everywhere, but the patients are still sick and requiring care. It is a very difficult system to make safe, and we're just beginning to realize how far we have to go with that. So that's another problem on this issue of best. But now I want to talk about two issues that really start to cut to the heart of this series of lectures. Uh, one of them is the issue of access to care. How, how can we consider ourselves a great nation when we're the only developed nation that has tens of millions of its citizens walking around with no health insurance coverage whatsoever? 45 million Americans. How many, again, how many people in this room have health insurance? <coughs> And yet 45 million Americans are walking around with no health insurance. And guess what? They are not the elderly. We put Medicare in place for the elderly. They're not the unemployed, because generally the unemployed can get in through the Medicaid system. Children of the poor now are better able to get in through something called the S-CHIP program. These are the working poor in America. And we're not creating fewer of them. We're forcing more and more people into that, a point I'm going to return to in a minute. Does that raise a question of human rights in the room? How about the rest of us, actually? Is access great for you? Has anybody in this room tried to get an appointment with a gastroenterologist recently or an endocrinologist? You very well may be told, across the nation, this is a, is a major problem, you may be told our first appointment is six months from now. Is that good access to health care? And yet that's what now, in some parts of the country, the insured are facing. And I'm going to come back and tell you why some of that has happened. So there's another area where there's clear evidence we're falling short. And finally, there's this area that gets called health disparities. Have any of you heard this term, health disparities? Do you know what that term means? What it translates to very realistically is that a male born in Baltimore today, if they're black, on average, 
will have a life expectancy eight years shorter than a male born in Baltimore was white. That is a fundamental health disparity. What is, what is amazing in our country is as a group, the minorities and the poor consistently show lower life expectancy, higher rates of infant mortality, birth defects, asthma, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer. Essentially, I just named all the major causes of morbidity and mortality. That's what health disparities are. Now, we may have time in the discussion to, to talk about this a bit. Um, is it genetics? Is it environment? Is it poverty? But I have a pretty hard time thinking that issue we just talked about, access to care, health insurance, doesn't have something uh, to do with it. I just heard about a book, and now I'm forgetting the authors. Maybe somebody knows the authors. It's a, a, a relatively recent book called The Uninsured in America. It's the book title, I'm sure, is The Uninsured in America. It gives these vivid stories of people who do their own dental extractions. Yeah, they, I think they picked this example to just you know, chill us to the bone, that people, because they don't have access to health care, essentially wait for their teeth to rot, literally, and then are forced, in some cases, they, they described a man who did his own dental extractions in order, because he couldn't afford any other route into the healthcare system. So, we live in a country that has this unusual juxtaposition. Uh, we're spending the most, latest drugs and technology, uh, best facilities, best experts, and some of us as individuals have virtually unlimited access to that but tens of millions of us are out of the loop. And then we have these large social issues of health disparities, the unfairness of the insurance system. So, are you depressed yet? <laughs> Guess what? I think we not only have this problem today, but I'm about to chill you by describing how quickly it could get much, much worse. And here's the real bad news for most of the people in this room. The younger you are, the more vulnerable you are to these forces. You know, there are some of us in this room within striking distance of Medicare as it exists today. Uh, most of the faces I see in this room have a ways to go. So you should care about the forces that are going to shape our system in the years to come. Well, what are some of those forces? We have uh, a star in demography sitting in the front row. And he has been passionate about helping us all understand that the great thing about demography, especially when you predict trends 10, 20 years out, is you're dealing with people who've already been born makes the prediction sometimes a little easier. Well, I'm a baby boomer. We were already born in that post-war period. And guess what we're doing? Aging. This huge population wave is about to hit, I hate to even say it, that geriatric point. And this is going to change, not just the face of America in many ways, it's going to change the face of healthcare. Today, 12% of Americans are 65 or older. By 2040, somewhere between 20 and 25% of Americans will be 65 or older. Today, we have 5 million Americans over 85. By that same year, 2040, some estimates are as high as 14 or 15 million Americans over 85 years old. So not only is the baby boom age, do we have this aging wave of the population, but they're people with different expectations. I had a, I had a grandmother, she has passed on, but she was in the uh, Oklahoma land rush, a homesteader in Oklahoma. 
You know, she was an incredible person. She lived into her 90s. And when you'd ask her how she was feeling or what her, especially, I was in medical school at the time, I'd ask her questions about her health. And she had one word, one, a one-sentence answer to everything. It was, she was German. She'd say, well, I cannot complain. That was her attitude toward health care. You know, don't complain. Don't think about it. She had very low expectations. Now, in the year 2040, I'm going to be 91, and I will be driving my orthopod crazy because I'm still going to want to fly fish. You know, this shoulder continues. I may even still want to ski, right? The baby boomers will have a whole different set of expectations. That's going to have massive effects on our healthcare system. So that's one future factor. Uh, most of you are not part of the baby boom. But as we're going to get to, we're going to expect somebody to take care of us. Do I see some volunteers in this room? How about something that, as a medical educator, worries me even more about the future? Uh, I referred to the OECD and the numbers uh, that, that they give out. Well, well, guess there are some other numbers where we're not the best in the world. Do you realize that we actually uh, are below the level of most comparable countries in terms of the number of physicians per 100,000 and the number of nurses. We actually have less in the way of a physician and nurse workforce than the, the comparable nation, uh, other nations in that database. I'm part of a working group that's been studying this problem. Our best estimates, some of you are thinking of going to medical school. You can do the math about when you would actually graduate and get into practice. We have emerging models that say in this country, by the year 2020, we may have a shortage of 200,000 physicians. And there's a problem with physicians because at the medical school, we don't have them freeze dried on a shelf, you know, add water and you've got what you need. It takes a good decade plus to go from a, a college undergraduate to producing a medical specialist. It takes more than that for some specialties. You can't turn around a problem like this on the dime. I think you all probably know that the, uh, the problem is just as bad in nursing. Huge nursing shortages. The nursing school here would love to increase its capacity. They can't even find the faculty numbers to build up the capacity they would like to. You're going to have to live in the middle of these shortages unless we do something. Now, how have, how have we decided? There have been shortages in this country in the past. There's a shortage now. How have we decided to fix that shortage? We, we outsource our problem, right? And we do it in an interesting way. Uh, just July 1st, the new residents started their medical training after getting their MDs. In the United States as a whole, one out of four residents who started July 1st got their medical education in another country. What's most fascinating to me is one out of 20 of those residents was a US citizen who was not successful getting into a medical school in the US, went offshore, often to the Caribbean, sometimes to Europe or Israel, got a medical degree, and then struggled to get back in. So we're importing or re-importing our own citizens to fix our healthcare workforce problem. Now, is that a good situation? Is that the best model in the world? OK, as if the future didn't look daunting enough, it also isn't the right kind of workforce. Because we still generally train physicians in isolation from nurses, in isolation from therapists. How do, how do airlines, which have achieved incredible degrees of safety, what, are, what is one of their best techniques for improving that safety? It's crew training. You've all heard of airline or seen airline simulators, right? Well, part of the exercises in airline simulators aren't just to test you as an individual. It's to show you how you work together as a crew under stressful conditions. We're only beginning to touch on that in medicine and healthcare. If you, can't, if you come down to Hershey, we have a simulation room, computerized mannequins who can go into cardiac arrest. 
and you can bring a team of medical students, nursing students, residents, respiratory therapy students into that room and do some crew training with them. But this is just beginning to take hold. So not only are we going to have a shortage, but the model we're using now to train people fails to train the kinds of teams that we think we're going to need. Graham mentioned our ambitious facilities plan. It isn't because we just want to get bigger. The United States has a facilities crisis too now. Every morning when I log on uh, and, and the infinite for the medical center comes up, there's a banner streaming across the bottom of the, the title screen. And it's either uh, yellow, red, or it can be blue or green. I have yet to see it blue or green. It's yellow or red because those are indicators that we are over capacity in the hospital. It is now our world that we constantly run over capacity. At 10 o'clock this morning, Monday mornings are the worst. At 10 o'clock this morning, we had roughly within the confines of our hospital about 120% as many patients as we had beds. Now you may ask, how does that work? We, we haven't put two people in a bed yet. What we have are people waiting to get picked up that we're trying to orchestrate their family, picking them up. We have patients coming in for surgery who are getting pre-op. We have people waiting in the OR. It is a grand dance to try and keep the system from breaking down because most of the hospitals around us are in the same plight we are. They're bursting at the seams. So we don't have enough facilities. And then, the last future fact, which uh, really worries me, is as much as we spend, all the signs are that it's not sustainable. Today's undergraduate hears about sustainability everywhere. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, of all the parts of our world that people question whether they're sustainable, the way we're financing healthcare in the United States isn't. Um, how many of you? who are under 35 have a, a great degree of confidence that Medicare will take care of your health care needs 30 years from now. Anybody? You know the facts, right? Uh, I'll give you another great website, gao.gov, the people who, the government accounting office, accountability office now, the people who are supposed to watch out for our interests. If you go into that website, you will see that the Comptroller General, the person who's supposed to watch out about your future financial health in America, has PowerPoints about how the Medicare system is going to break down on top of us all in a matter of years. I haven't heard him talk most recently, but you know, we can't do things like add, like we're doing today, we can't add $200 billion of debt to take care of Katrina without just making that breakdown of Medicare get a little, a lot closer, right? Because it's all tied up in this whole issue of an unfunded liability, a debt we've created you know, I will be increasing that debt in another nine years. I'll be using Medicare. And you know what our strategy is right now? <clears throat> for you to pay for it. Right? Medicare is called a trust fund, but there's no account for Daryl Kirch in the Medicare trust fund. What it really is, is I don't know how many of you have looked or have earned paychecks to look. It's coming out of those paychecks. And, and here's where it really gets difficult. Whereas in the past, the whole thing worked because we had more people working than were retired. In the 60s, when Medicare got started and Social Security was looking strong, there were five people working for every retiree. Uh, when I'm retired, it will be closer to two people working. So I'm looking for two of you to adopt me. <laughs> That's what it may feel like, right? If you have two workers supporting the Social Security and Medicare needs of a retiree, uh, Medicaid, I don't even want to get started. Uh, it's an even worse situation, the system of, of health care insurance for the poor. Uh, right now, our own state and every other state is looking for ways to cut back on Medicaid because they just can't afford it anymore. The uh, combined percentage of the total federal budget that goes to Medicare and Medicaid was zero 
in the 60s because they were just getting started. It climbed in 1984 to about 9% of all federal spending was for these two health programs. Today, it's close to 20%. And this is before the baby boom generation is in your laps, figuratively, if not you know, moving in with you. So those are the future factors. I, and there was one I, I actually, as I was looking at the speakers, I added because these are all fairly predictable. These are going to happen. But what Katrina, what 9-11 and now Katrina reminded us of is there are some things out there that we can't predict. In, uh, this, in October, your speaker is Stephen Wing, who I think is going to talk about this whole issue of how prepared are we or aren't we for the kinds of crises that might be out there. Uh, and they could take this very volatile situation and make it much worse. Look at what Katrina has done. I mean, how many of you also didn't have your hearts break when you saw those photos or video clips of hospitals in New Orleans with patients sitting on sidewalks uh, in a parking garage? Nowhere to go. No evacuation. Uh, one of our, our uh, two of our ambulance crews were down there and just have returned. Uh, they said, and some of them are military veterans, they said it was unbelievable how unprepared we really were for this. So there's that issue in the mix too. So before we just uh, all increase our antidepressant doses, let's talk about the way out, because I, I wouldn't be up here. I wouldn't have set this scenario up. I don't know what I'd do. Maybe move to a Scandinavian country. <laughs> if I didn't think we could find a way out of this country, and I'm going to hope, I'm going to close with with what I think are a few of the solutions. I can tell you one thing that isn't the solution. Technology isn't going to save us. One of the most common points in the debate was, well, won't there be a breakthrough? You know, won't some professor figure out something uh, that will just solve all this for us and make the whole system run? In my experience, the more we discover about science, drugs, and devices, uh, the more we discover how hard it is to pay for it. And I'm going to tell you a story that illustrates this better than anything I've ever seen. How many of you are Pennsylvania taxpayers? Okay. There was a gentleman, a Wall Street Journal story in 2001 by uh, Ron Winslow. And uh, this was all in the public record. I'm not divulging any private health information. And his story focused on a gentleman who actually was a former Pennsylvanian who had worked for state government. So we were paying this gentleman's retirement and health care benefits out of our taxes. That's the way the system works. This gentleman had moved to North Carolina to enjoy his retirement. At age 69, he developed a very unusual, inexplicable bleeding disorder. He stopped. He was bleeding, and they couldn't get him to clot properly. And the bleeding worsened and worsened. And they started making use of every tool at their disposal, including some very recently developed and exceedingly expensive, hard to obtain clotting factors. Some of them were flown in on charter jets in order to save this man. And he got worse and worse and worse and he deteriorated. And 34 days later, this 69-year-old gentleman died. This all took place at Duke University Medical Center, one of the greatest medical centers in the United States. Any guess about the hospital bill? $5.2 million. <laughs> It's an incredible story. Is technology going to save us? It will save lives. It hopefully will improve the quality of life, but it is not going to deal with this matrix of financial issues. What will save us? A fundamental change in our attitudes. You know, the, the solution lies in what we believe, how we carry out our values, and how we behave. <coughs> I'm going to challenge you. Tom Gorey, who's a friend of mine who works with Johnson & Johnson, says Americans are very simple people. We only want five things from health care. Okay. You listen to the five, and you tell me whether this is what you want to. We want absolutely the best health care. 
We want it immediately. We want the latest drugs and technology, especially if we saw them advertised on television last night. We want somebody else to pay for it. And if anything goes wrong, we want to sue someone. <laughs> Any ring of truth there? I mean, is that the society we've created? Is that what you've seen around you and, and, and maybe inadvertently grown to want and expect? I add two ones to that that I, I think are especially dangerous. Uh, how did we get to be number one in obesity? We, we, we don't want to change our behavior. Any of you seen that, that film, Supersize Me? You know, it, it's an illustration of, of the disconnection between our behaviors and their net result. And then there's the last one that was illustrated by that case at Duke. And that is, how many of you have had a, a relative, a family member, a friend, terminally ill, and seen people say, please do everything possible? You know, we live in a country where we have so much faith in ourselves that even at the end of life, we want to try everything possible. Sometimes not stepping back and saying, what's the cost here? What's, what's the cost to that person in terms of their suffering? We've got to come to terms with our wants. I, I think we can line them up, but we're going to have to deal with some funny ideas we have. One of the funny ideas we have, if you think about a society and its health care, right? We tax each other one way or another and we give out benefits. That's the way society takes care of social problems. We have this unusual notion in America that we should have unlimited benefits and very low taxes. Now, you can do that, but ultimately somebody has to pay the bill. And guess who's holding the bill right now? It's not me. It's really the generation of most of you in this room. You know? That's the system we've set up with Medicare. We're adding benefits to Medicare. You all very graciously have, have attached your future paychecks so that President Spanier and I can have a very uh, generous Medicare prescription drug benefit. And we're both very thankful for that. But the bottom line is that will be paid. Unless we change the benefit structure, that'll be paid by you in the future. We've got to find this balance point between what we really expect as benefits and what we're willing to pay for it. And so the bottom line for me is that we, we've got to rethink our notion of health insurance. You know, what do we think health insurance is right now in America? Is it a, a magical pot of funds that, that is uh, bottomless and there for everybody? No. You know, the things I've just told you show that it isn't. But we're acting as if it is. What we have to recapture, I think, is actually a social concept of health insurance something that really is there for everybody to protect them against catastrophe, something that's not there as an unlimited benefit for a few people that leaves a lot of people out in the cold. When, when I was a first year medical student, how many of you are taking an ethics course or have taken a medical ethics course? You know, it, it's really interesting. You know, for the last 30 years, they always, in the first lecture or two, they tell you there are only four principles, basic principles of medical ethics you need to know as a doctor. And those four are autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. Well, let's take, and, and when I sit down with a patient, I'm supposed to be thinking, I respect their autonomy. I do my best to do good, beneficence, and I do my best to avoid harm, non-maleficence. And I try to treat them in a just and fair manner. So let's, let's finish by testing our US healthcare system against those four principles. Do we respect autonomy? Actually, we do. We've declared it every person for himself or herself. You know what, in a sense, we've turned autonomy on its head so that not only are we treating people as individuals, we're abandoning it. I don't think that is what the principle of autonomy, which may be very important in an individual case, I don't think that's the way it should play out in a society. 
Do we have beneficence in the system? Yes, that poor gentleman who died at Duke got $5.2 million of beneficence. You know, there were huge resources devoted to them. But it's the uneven evenness with which the good is being done. Does it do harm? What about those people extracting their own teeth? You know, isn't this system hard? What about people who don't come for health care until they're so sick they have to come to the ER? We see that in our emergency room 24 hours a day. People who are there in an emergency room and not a clinic office because they don't have insurance. Is that just the fourth principle? You can decide. I'm going to finish now, and we're going to talk a bit, OK? Thank you very much. We are webcasting this, so we need you, when you ask a question, to talk into the microphones. And though it may make it harder for people who are taping, we'll bring them to you. So if you'll raise your hands, we'll get you a mic. Even more than questions, we want answers. <laughs> yes. Anyone for questions or answers? I think perhaps you have uh, deliberately avoided the questions of single payer plans, uh, avoiding the tremendous, let's call it, uh, insurance costs of administration and administration of medical care, and so forth. Would not uh, a single payer, being in the federal government, uh, eliminate most of that? And I think that we've tied ourselves up in America. Most of you aren't old enough to even remember the, the attempt at health care reform in the Clinton administration, which was a very complex proposal that went nowhere. But the bottom line is I think we tie ourselves up in the debate about should the market solve it or should government solve it and tolerate the injustice. I personally feel if you got more upset, if I got more upset, if collectively we got more outraged about the injustice of our current system, we would move toward the solution. My personal opinion is that it will, in this country, be a hybrid model uh, that has elements of, of a government safety net, but that still retains access to some private care. I just, knowing what I think I know about the American psyche, I think that that is probably what we will evolve to. See, what I'm concerned about is we, we, we get stuck on this question, and then we, don't, we lose all our energy. Uh, there was a presidential candidate a couple elections ago who had an elderly woman come up to him, and she was just outraged. And she said, I don't care what else you do if you get into the White House, but don't let the government get involved in my Medicare. <laughs> You know, it, there's all this emotion about should it be a government solution or a market solution. The emotion should be about the, the social tragedy that we've created. Yes. When I was here, oh, that's loud, sorry. When I was here for my master's, how many years ago now? Long time, probably. <laughs> nine years ago, uh, one of the research projects that I did was on the insurance companies. And at that point in time, the one that sticks vividly in my memory was the CEO for Sigma, his salary alone was $2.1 million. So I see what this gentleman's saying. I, I personally find that repugnant because the basic right of health care I think is what we should all be fighting for. I've worked as a nurse for many, many years. I've been a nurse for 26 years. I work as an NP now. And I think looking at that disparity, why should they be taking those premiums and getting salaries of several million dollars at that point in time? It's probably more now, plus the perks. And I'm sure he's not the only one. So it's not, it's not just the high costs. It's sort of the rottenness in the whole structure of the system. And I don't know how you'd respond to that. But I don't think that something as important as basic health care should be a stock market commodity. 
and maybe I'm very radical, but I don't think that's right. We make a, <laughs> we make a social decision about whether something is a commodity or a, a social right, a social good. Uh, we're making that decision, as the students in this room know, America is making that decision about your own education. You know, as states back away from funding higher education, it becomes more privatized and it starts to look more like a commodity. And you and your parents see that than like a social good. And we have done that dramatically with healthcare. You're right. Uh, my personal preference is to uh, is to treat health care like a social good. I would be very comfortable in a system in which we acted that way. What I want to do, though, is rather than engage in some sort of verbal civil war in America about whether markets are better or government is better, is to, to appeal to the best instincts all the people in this room have, which is, don't, you, don't we care? Don't we care about those uninsured people? Don't we care about the health disparities? And I think that if we can get more energy behind that, it will slowly but surely move us to the right solution. I'd, I'd be interested to hear from some of the, the students in the room your view of this. Is, I can't read your faces. Is this your, boy, I hope somebody fixes this before I'm earning a paycheck? Yes. A brave soul on the left. <laughs> well, not so brave because I don't have, don't think I have anything constructive to say, but I'm more, I feel like we're kind of just waiting around. Like we're telling this is big problem, this is big problem, this is big problem. It's like, okay, I'm an undergraduate. Uh, I'm gonna be worried about a job when I come out of school. I mean, is there something I can immediately do right now? Is there something I could do over the course of the next five years other than perhaps putting a little money away for health costs that'll probably be astronomical? It's kind of a feeling of helplessness, I suppose. Yeah. I, well, I would go back to these points and say, in the end, this cannot be solved without government playing a central role. The, the only, everybody agrees with that. The only question is whether government, will government be the only player, okay? But we have been electing people, and those of you old enough have been voting too, who did not have this on the centerpiece of their screen. You know, we have to, above all, make this the front burner issue in, in, I believe, in our next presidential election. And I think that's where you have some real power because your voices get heard. Here's the problem. Most of you are healthy and most of you see this as a problem out there. Now, it should be obvious to you. I've tried to remind you of how real this problem is for you today. And, and it, it, it's real in ways you wouldn't imagine. Any of you work at Starbucks? Do you know, you, okay, this, this statistic, I saw a Business Week interview with the chairman of Starbucks and I nearly fainted when I saw this. Do you realize that Starbucks now as a corporate entity pays more for healthcare benefits than it does for coffee beans? You add it all together. That's incredible. Now Starbucks actually prides itself on giving good health benefits, but you know what? He was saying this in the context of this Business Week interview, knowing it can't continue. Uh, President Spanier and I have been talking a lot about this, this university. We deal through insurance companies as a university, but we're self-insured. We're bearing the risk. This year, our total university and Hershey Medical Center are spending, just out of our budget as a university for healthcare benefits, I think it's roughly 140 million. 70 last year. Yeah, in 10 years, it'll easily be a half, more than a half billion dollars a year, maybe approaching 300 or three quarters of a billion dollars just for Penn State to provide health care benefits to faculty and staff. There's a quarter, third of your salary is what the, so isn't it between like a quarter and a third of their salary? It's like a hidden to provide. Is that correct? Well, 
Yes, it's, it's a significant portion of our investment in compensation. It's the largest portion of benefits, and, and it's a significant portion of overall stock. But we're hidden from it, right? People who in here who happen to work here or in another job, you know what your health care premium is, but do you know what the employer was paying for it? You know, we've had a system in America where everybody was shielded from that. I know we're talking about how fixing health care is important, but something else that's linked with health care is pharmaceuticals. And how would we get the pharmaceuticals companies, which is big business here and around the world, on the same page if we start to reform our own health care? Because some people can't have the drugs they have because they're outpriced. Like, some people, which some drugs for some needs are outpriced to the people who require them the most. I, I, I can't imagine a day in America when we nationalize the pharmaceutical companies, and I can think of a lot of reasons to not do that. But we, we do have examples where we haven't taken advantage of some of our leverage as, as big purchasers of pharmaceuticals to get them to do some things that we would like them to do to help us contain costs. I don't want to go into the details of it, but part of the reason the Medicare drug benefit, in my view, played out as such a, a bad idea was because we didn't structure it in a way to get the pharmaceutical companies to help us drive some cost down. You know, this is America. We love capitalism. But we loved it, have loved it so much that we've inadvertently allowed healthcare to get swept up into it and pharmaceutical manufacturing and other things. It's going to take a very conscious effort on our part to pull parts of this system out of capitalism and get them back more under the heading of a social good. Uh, I just wanted to give a, a personal story. I have an interesting uh, view, I feel. I have an international student from Canada. And uh, so all this talking about uh, trying to have the government have a more active role in the government in the healthcare and coming from Ontario where we pay 15% taxes to have paid for healthcare. And uh, that comes with its own issues as well. We have uh, right now a, uh, a severe uh, GP shortage because they don't get paid enough to go into uh, that practice. And I know a uh, personal story, my grandparents uh, moved away from where their GP was and continued to commute four and a half hours to their old GP because they couldn't find one in the new city. Uh, also, uh, the present government right now has just moved into having a third tier healthcare system. So we uh, do now have some private uh, clinics that you can go to because there are anything up to six months to a year wait to get a CAT scan. Uh, the Ontario government pays for patients actually to come to the states to use their facilities down here because you just don't have the same kind of facilities or the same money to use. Um, so it's just an interesting side, different side of the coin, you know, different problems. And you see in the United Kingdom, Germany, and other nations that had essentially single payer, uh, totally government run healthcare systems now in some cases moving toward acknowledging the need for some pri more private elements. You're talking about CAT scans. Anybody from Orange County? Uh, Orange County, California has more MRI scanners than the entire nation of Canada. <laughs> you know, we, we sort of represent the extremes. You know, I'm sure there are lots of unneeded fairly expensive MRI scans done in Orange County, and in Canada you may wait months for a scan you do need. Somewhere in the middle there's a solution set, I believe. Yes, sir. Yes, as you mentioned earlier about uh, turning on television and watching a TV program, having to watch four or five pharmaceutical commercials advertising mm -hmm. their new drug, is that helping the medical field or is that hindering it? Do, you, do you find? Think? I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> Somebody once joked, you know, one of the best things we could do to improve outcomes around cardiovascular uh, disease uh, would be to be even more rig rigorous about the way we administer aspirin to candidate patients when they hit, hit the, the healthcare system. Aspirin 
you know, it's been around for 100 plus years. It has some very beneficial properties. And I heard a speaker once say, the reason we don't do a better job of that is it's not advertised on television, it's not purple, and it doesn't cost $65 a tablet. In answer to your question, direct-to-consumer advertising, in my experience, tends to distort the system by raising the wants of people more than it explains to people what's really good medicine. Did you have a follow-up? So it's kind of turning into a pop culture of pharmaceuticals. People want them because they're on television. They don't want the other things because they're... Well, look at the advertising. Without getting into details, look at the products that are most heavily advertised. Well, uh, not Vioxx anymore. Um, let's, uh, well, let's put it this way. The, uh, uh, the various aids for various male problems, the various aids for joint disease, you know, think about it. Who's the target audience? The aging baby boomers and their high expectations around health care. Now, there are other ads, but, but those are really the target audience. Uh, the anti-osteoporosis drugs. Uh, this is marketing, plain and simple, to raise our wants and our expectations. Now, some of those drugs are very appropriate in many cases, but that should be a, a decision of medical need, not what did you see last time. Nancy, I'm going to rely on you about when you want to wind, wind things up. Hi. Um, I kind of feel the same as a lot of people here, where you, you, we hear a lot of numbers, we hear a lot about the problems, but we feel kind of helpless about what we can do. Um, there seems to be a lot of discussion about how to deal with the escalating cost. I'm just wondering, in terms of minimizing the cost, um, just in, personally, in terms of uh, preventative medicine, changing habits early on now that we're young, you know, healthier lifestyles, eating better, things like that. And also from the standpoint of a healthcare provider, um, one of the, the stats you gave us, 40 to 90,000 people dying every year from, uh, from mistakes, medical mistakes. And I'm sure that the numbers of people that have accidental infections and, and non-fatal problems is much higher. And there's, um, there's all this cost that's built into healthcare to deal with all those problems. And how, I guess I'm wondering in your thoughts on, on what we can do to prevent the problem from getting worse and maybe try to make it better. Let me, this, this is going to take one minute, but I think it's worth your hearing. Penn State, I believe right now, is on the verge of building a better model. And we're in an unusual position to do it. Penn State is, is the largest employer outside of government in this state. Okay? We're huge. We're self-insured for our health insurance. So it's our money collectively. And, and we're working on a model that is going to fix what I think is one of the biggest problems. And that's that you and me, I'm an employee, right? I'm, I use health, the health care system. You and I have been almost bystanders in the whole process. You know, the closest we get to it is seeing the ad on television and thinking, yeah, maybe that drug sounds good for me. Uh, we, but we've been outside it. We just went through a, a set of meetings with faculty and staff and asked them simple questions like, do you know how much we're contributing to your health care cost? Now, they know they see a monthly premium deduction for themselves out of their paycheck. Fewer than 5% of people could answer that question at all. They, they were bystanders about it. We asked another question. I'll ask this to you. How many of you have an advanced directive, you know, simple form filled out about what you would want to have happen at the end of life? You know, very important tool to keep cost from being run up. Our employees, who are very good people, were out of the loop on all this. The other thing they'd never thought about that, that I'll share with you that's very interesting is have any of you, for the students, have most of you been fully employed and in a health benefits plan? One of the things that's curious about health benefits plans is that everybody pays the same monthly premium, the same cost, regardless of their income. So unlike Canada, where you pay income taxes based on your income for your health care, 
if you work for an American company, if you come to work at Hershey today, if you were a highly skilled surgeon earning $350,000 a year, or the person cleaning the OR at the end of the day after that surgery, you both pay the same dollar amount for your health care. Now that's interesting, but here it gets even more interesting. Guess what percent of their annual income then the surgeon is paying and the OR tech is paying? The surgeon is paying less than one half of one percent of their annual income for health care insurance. The OR tech today is paying six percent. With gas, three dollars a gallon, heating oil going up, when are we hitting the point where the OR tech says, I appreciate your offering health insurance, but I can't even pay that? So one of the things we're doing that has generated a lot of discussion is we're switching to a system where premiums are tied to income. We're switching to a system where people are going to be incentivized financially for knowing what their BMI is. Everybody in this room know your BMI? And know whether it's in the healthy range? Well, a lot of our employees don't. That's how you know, the obesity problem became. Incentivizing people for that. We want to incentivize those people who still do smoke, and one in five does smoke, to enter smoking cessation programs. So, you know, under the heading of wringing our hands, no, we're not wringing our hands. What I hope Penn State, and I hope other people do this, while we wait for government to get in the game, for us to exercise our right to the vote, and get this on the screen for government, we're trying to build a better model within ourselves as employers, and we hope other people follow. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming today. You've been a great audience.